I'm Gary Tallheimer of the Steering Committee, and tonight's topic, as you all know, is Dwight Fisk and the Birth of the Party Record, uh, presented by Uncle Dave Lewis. Or do you want your legitimate name? Uh, yeah, or David Neil Lewis. Uh, David N. David Neil Lewis but everybody knows him as Uncle Dave. Uh, for many collectors, the legacy of the 1930s to 1950s party record is a mixed one. In their era, these under-the-counter novelties enlivened many a dull evening with a sudden shock of scurrilous, though through phonographic misbehavior, raising the eyebrows of unsuspecting prudes and bringing a new level of hilarity to go with one's cocktail. Despite their age, party records can still shock through their cr crudity and sexual candor. Yet today they are often viewed as the kitschy byproducts of a repressed society and the fastest way that, that a photograph can drag one's mind down into the gutter. However, the father of the party record, Dwight Fisk, 19, 1892 to 1959, was anything but lowbrow. He was a ferociously talented pianist and aspiring modernist composer who had set himself along the same course taken by Cole Porter and Aaron Copeland. Yet Fisk abandoned the course once he began to entertain expatriate Americans with smutty tales of amoral royals and high-class citizens in the saloons and nightclubs of Between the Wars Paris. The party record industry happened because Dwight Fisk had the nerve to go forward in recording his naughty routines, despite the threat of censorship. Nevertheless, in just two decades, he was a relic, his contribution forgotten in the rash toward revolution in American comedy. Three decades of research went into the paper on Fisk published in the fall of 20. 017 issue of the Ask Journal by David Deal and David Neil Lewis. And in this presentation, Uncle Dave will expand on the research, sharing examples of Fisk's recordings and excerpts from his early compositions. And to give you a bit of background on our speaker, Uncle Dave Lewis is a native of Cincinnati, Ohio, and a recognized expert in media history. He is also a writer, composer, and musicologist, now based in Virginia. In the 1980s, he was one of the figureheads of an underground music movement in Cincinnati and co-host of the pioneering avant-garde radio show, Art Damage, and ran the Hospital Records label. Based in Los Angeles in the 1960s, he worked as a classical buyer for t the Tower Records and Virgin Megastore chain, but saw the writing on the wall and with a, the arrival of the internet. From 2001 to 2010, he was an in-house editor for the All Music Guide and since then has worked for the UCSB libraries Discography of American Historic Recordings Project and at the Library of Congress. The summer of 2018 finds him back in the record business working at Switz Mix Records in Luray, Virginia and freelancing on articles and CD liner notes. And so, with the party records, here's Uncle Dave. Thank you, Gary. I have some additional thank yous. I want to thank you all for coming, by the way, and 
sitting around and waiting for me on the first day of summer. Um, I want to thank the New York chapter of ARSC, Seth Winter, who is unable to be with us tonight, and Gary, uh, Dennis Rooney, David Deal, my collaborator in this project, Tim Page, Randy Riddle, Peter Minton, Rebecca Lewis, Greg Fernandez, the Internet Archive, of whom, whom I didn't use any of their tracks today, and the uh, Queer Music Heritage Project. Thank you all. Okay, so uh, usually with these talks, I begin with a musical sample in the first side slide. So, Mr. Soundman, let's track one roll. Oh, aha. Uh -huh. Well, then I'll do that. Mrs. Pettibow. Now, it all happened in a little country town. The women's guild were holding their annual Friday afternoon meeting. Miss Mary Alden said, the 58-year-old president, verge into the end. I rose and said, girls, you remember last Friday, we took up the subject of old Japan. Lousy country. But this being the last Friday before the 25th, we're going to take up a subject very near your heart, but very rarely mentioned in this thriving community. Sex. Good old sex. Okay, uh, page down. Warning. To begin, I would like to provide a disclaimer, something that should have come along with the publicity material for this program, but I spaced. Um, this program will include ribald humor, salacious jokes, some coarse or foul language, and frequent references to sexual situations not to mention a couple of images of, of, of a sexual nature. If you are offended by such content, then this program is probably not for you, although you'll probably sit through it because you waited so long. Okay. Um, looking out amongst the crowd tonight, by the way, I, it appears that everyone here is an adult. So um, I figure we can proceed with the program as I've conceived it. Uh, one thing that I do tend to take for granted uh, as I encountered my first party records when I was too young to have them, um, and I tend to think everyone must have known about these things, that the party record is something that belongs to the past, an under-the-counter relic of days gone by when sexuality was not discussed openly and one could still go to jail on obscenity charges for taking the subject too far in public. However, my wife, Rebecca, comes from a Quaker family, and when I would pull one of these records out and, uh, and uh, with their kitschy cheese baked cake covers and expect a laugh, what I got was stunned disbelief instead. And she tells me, you don't understand, David. I've never seen these things, and I never knew that they were made. So what is a party record? Well, here's a particularly in-your-face example. Oh. Oh, Santa. Oh, Santa, please. Oh, Santa, please don't. Oh, Santa, please don't stop. Oh, Santa, please don't stop coming round. It's finally Christmas Eve, and you have come to call. I bought a brand new nightie, but I'm waiting in my hall to gather, cause my nightie is hanging on the wall. So come on, Santa, let's have a ball. Oh, Santa, please don't stop coming round. Oh, Santa, please don't stop. Oh, Santa, please don't. Oh, Santa, please. Oh, Santa. Oh. K 
Martin with Come On Santa, Let's Have a Ball from her album, I Know What He Wants for Christmas, But I Don't Know How to Wrap It. This record dates from 1962, which is near or at the end of the history of party records. Generally sold under the counter at record stores whose offerings were in some manner of depth. Uh, party records were so called because they were aimed at a specific purpose to liven up adult get-togethers with cocktails and hors d'oeuvres, a little additional ribaldry to go along with one's fondue pot. Double entendre was the order of the day with a lot of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, did you get that type of humor. Okay. The party record represented the major underground sector of the rent record industry before the advent of underground music. Like, uh, it, which didn't appear, well, this album, which I consider the first record of underground rock music, didn't appear until 1964. And uh, the party, and uh, yeah, I, this is another example of a classic. This is more from Dwight's time. Rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, three men in a tub. My, how unsanitary. I'm so happy, oh so happy, I could shout with glee. The thing I've always wanted has finally come to me. Even when I was a boy, I used to ask my dad, say, why can't I have one like that? He'd say, go away, my lad. I felt so small and puny beside the other men. But what could you expect, my friend? Cause I was only 10. Now, Pop said, if you'll be patient, son, and do your very best, I'll tell you a few secrets, and nature will do the rest. My father had a thick one, was just as big as this. I used to hide and watch him as he'd flick it at a mist. My uncle had a cute one, it was ooh, so small and thin. And though the men all laughed at him, he'd say, this thing ain't tin. My grandpa had a big one, wow, was that a beaut. I give you my word of honor, it hung halfway down his suit. It makes no difference what the size, or even if it's colored, long or short, fat or thin, as long as the thing is solid. As I got a little older, mine started in to grow. Just what it would finally look like, I really didn't know. I would nurse it and pat it, and I'd give it every care. I'd stand before the mirror for hours and just stare. I'd measure it each morning to me for such a treat to find that it had grown some. That's a thrill it can't be beat. Now all my work was not in vain. They call me Dapper Dan. I've got a full grown mustache. Today I am a man. Pretty good clarinet player. Rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, three men in a tub. My, how interesting. Move over, boys. <laughs> That's actually kind of unusual, the very end uh, for record party records of that period to go kind of into the queer angle. That doesn't happen much. Um, okay. By the time that I encountered, first encountered adult comedy records at the song shop in Cincinnati about 1974, true party records had already gone the way of all things. The adult comedy section was kept in a regular bin, which as a 13-year-old I was probably not supposed to be looking through. One of the albums in that bin was Rudy Ray Moore's Eat Out More Often, an example of a later breed of adult comedy record, something that was openly blue with little left to the imagination and a lot of foul language employed, more than you or I would ever use in an average casual conversation. Um, I recently learned 
that a Rudy Ray Moore biopic is in development with Eddie Murphy as the star. All right. Although Rudy Ray Moore's work leaves its predecessors in the dust in terms of out-and-out -out obscenity, shall we say, the, if the earlier party records hadn't existed, there wouldn't have been no industry to support this kind of project. We have begun by touching on the end of the story of party records, but in order to understand its beginnings, it goes back to the industrious work of just one man, Dwight Fisk. An excellent capsule description of Dwight Fisk's records was posted on the old 78L back in 2002 by a collector named Dennis Forkel. Fisk was a real hoot. He accompanied himself on the piano with apparently original music and material. His monologues are wicked, witty, and risque for the time, and his delivery, delivery was that of a jaded, weary of the world raconteur, but still with a naughty gleam in his eye, which of course one can't see by way of an audio-only medium, but it's felt. Forkel's post went on to ask just about who Dwight Fisk was and how he got away with recording such racy stuff in such a prudish era. I had the very same thoughts when I first encountered Fisk through some records I found in a thrift store in 1982. For 78 collectors, Fisk's work can be transformative as it challenges long-held notions about morality and censorship during the Great um, Depression. Whereas the usual benchmark for the moral stranglehold on content in the 1930s is the opposition to the use of the crucial word damn in MGM's film of Gone with the Wind, Fisk whose best recordings date from 1939, 33 to 39, liberally uses damn, hell, and even goddamn, which today is less than acceptable in some quarters. To ears accustomed to artists like George Carlin and Andrew Dice Clay, Fisk may come off as quaint, a little shy of a hard R, but his unabashed explorations on the lives of unfaithful couples, bosses lusting for secretaries, and then the sexual caprices of figures from distant history is not something one commonly expects to hear welling up from old shellac discs. For his wife, the most hyphenated man in New York, was born on the outer edge of a swanky golf club with a gold spoon and a peach pit in his mouth. He never knew he was an extra man until he was 10 years old. But Alice Leon Most knew it the day he was born. She had him on her New York luncheon list and fun in the country Tweedy type. Now Harrington's clothes were a marked cross between Lucius Phoebe and Hayward Brew. He never knew whether he was in town or the country until he looked in his mirror. And even then he wasn't sure, until he asked his valet, who was known as Pudge, but not too well. Harrington had had so many blondes in his adolescence that he was colorblind from the birth. Can you believe it? But his mother never found it out, until 21 years later when he picked his bride in Tahiti. He'd been sent on a half-world cruise for a bad cold, which got worse as he got better. He called his bride Gumdrop the Second only because she was a goddamn dumb. She used to make little crunching noises with her toes, which meant yes, or no, or how have I been? Every afternoon at five, they used to drink coconut milk and hum. Did you take that? And then at seven, they'd fight the versa if they could. She was a pearl buyer from Altman, and twice a year went down to the oyster beds in person with a tray marked mine. Harrington met her underwater and took a tray right away from her. So they were married in a breadfruit hat and a pair of cum quart maids. 
When Mother Hiss twice heard the news, she leaped on the Empress of Australia and six smaller boats to try and stop the flow of her son's blood in strange channels. When she arrived on the island incognito and plenty tight, a cold shiver passed over her person. When she realized that Gumdrop Bay was something her pappy and not Elizabeth Arden had given her, she begged her son to forget the whole thing and come home and start from it. But Harrington said, No, no, mother. I'm a slave to my favorite glass. So she and Harrington picked up the trademark mine and dove down to the oyster bed, leaving Mother his wife flat and mad as hell. Now the moral of this story is, if you can't wait for what you want, you gotta take what you can get. He goes kind of fast, so um, <clears throat> I wouldn't blame you if you weren't, weren't able to follow all of that, but we just heard a story about a useless, spoiled, well, actually, the, the racist mother, wealthy mother of a useless, spoiled, rich kid who goes to Tahiti and marries a native girl who dives for pearls named Gun, Gumdrop the Second. Um, yeah, that's a very surreal routine, and it was recorded in 1939. Now, um, this, that was the record that really grabbed my friend Greg Fernandez. The next one I'm going to play uh, is the one that grabbed me, His Excellency, um, which uh, I must say, I, I like, I, when I was a teenager, I loved 19th century Russian novels. So this wasn't much of a stretch. His Excellency. His Excellency Paul Theodore Matov was very close to the Tsar and despite his 50 odd years of high living was very well preserved for a man his age. But he had just married for the third time a beautiful blonde, Katarina Kapovich. She was so young, so ravishing, so full of nya, that he suspected her of being unfaithful. The twinkle in the eyes of the young officers and the heavy breathing of the old diplomat made him nervous. And there was one man, God, whose intentions were almost honorable. But he said to himself, as long as I am in St. Petersburg, nothing can happen to my beautiful wife, Katarina Kapovich. But alas, alas, one bitter winter day. When the River Neva was frozen right to the bottom, word came from the Imperial Palace that he must depart at once for Sebastopol with two cavalry officers to buy three black horses for the Tsar. Naturally, he choked with rage at the royal command. And he thought, what will happen to my beautiful wife, Katharina Kapovich? Or I will go to my good friend, Dmitri of the secret police. He will follow her every move. Now, three weeks later, he returned from the Crimea with the three black horses for the Tsar. And fear in his heart for the faithfulness of his beautiful wife, Katharina Kapovich. On arriving in town, he went straight to his good friend, Dmitri of the secret police. Tell me, Dmitri, what has happened in my absence? Was my wife faithful? Do not spare me, Dmitri, do not spare me. Your Excellency, I cannot tell. I cannot tell. It is too much. I cannot tell. Tell me, Dimitri, or I will kill you. I will really kill you, Dimitri. Well, Your Excellency, the first night they made violent love on the sofa. And then they had a little vodka. Oh, lovely, lovely vodka. And then they had a little zakuska. You know what I mean. They had a lot of zakuska. And then they embraced madly. What happened then, Dimitri? What happened then? 
tell me what happened then. Your Excellency, I cannot tell. It is too much. It is really too much. You would not like it if I told you. Tell me, Dimitri, or I will murder you. Well, the second night, they went upstairs to his bedroom. She took off everything. Mm -hmm. What did he do, Dimitri? What did he do? Well, Your Excellency, he first took off his shoes. And then he took off his braces, the ones the Countess Silka gave him with a big monogram. Pretty. And then he took off everything. What happened then, Dimitri? What happened then? Tell me all what happened then. What happened then, Your Excellency? I could not see. They turned out the light. Doubt. Doubt. Always now. That's a great record. As you can see from the label images, Fist records are very plain in appearance, and that was deliberate. They didn't want to look attractive to prying eyes, especially kids, and they were often sold in special kind of anonymous-looking booklets that held them to keep the little paws off them. From listening to these records, though, um, it was easy to tell that Fisk was somebody important, perhaps even famous for what he did. Back in 1982, there wasn't really any way for me to figure that out. Now, I did, at the time, there was a dot matrix printer that was plugged into a computer that you could actually enter in search terms and then you could print out a long dot matrix sheet of citations from, for magazine articles. And I didn't realize at the time that that was actually an early form of the internet. Uh, and I did plug Dwight Fisk in there and brought up absolutely nothing. Nowadays, um, while he isn't plainly on the web, I mean, he's around, and Internet Archive has like 16 of his records posted. Um, however, we wouldn't know anything about Dwight if it weren't for David Deal, who started looking for information on Dwight at the same time that I did, but he just had far more success with it. And so the biographical information that you will hear really comes from David. Oh, I forgot to change. That's the label of His Excellency. Okay. W. Edward and Bertha L. Fisk ushered in baby Dwight Lewis Fisk, innocent, naked, into the world on August the 25th, 1892. And, of course, when you don't have a baby picture, um, go ahead and make one, even if it's a bad one. Um, after the death of his father, Fisk's mother married one Fred A. Bradford in 1901, and the 1910 U.S. Census indicates two servants in the household, so it can be assumed that his mother married up. Um, in the liner notes to his album, Musical Satires, Fisk tells us that his first compositions written at age five were The Ho Horse With No Ears, and The Little Mouse in the Blue Boat, both described as song stories, being narratives with musical accompaniment. The same source also tells us that Fisk studied piano and composition in Boston, where he received the superlative training for serious music, which his talent justified. That's interesting. Is it possible that he had contact with um, the, uh, the second New England school composers like Mrs. Beach and Chadwick? Um, nevertheless, uh, there is strong evidence in his playing that would suggest that Fisk's early experience was largely in the silent movie house. Um, as an accompanist, so much of it that there's little doubt that he worked in this realm, although I've never found anything where it said that he did. In his routine, 
Uh, routines, Fisk often uses augmented tension chords to underlay forward mo motion in his narratives, and his music is sprinkled with quotations from tunes germane to the silent movie house, though often slyly disguised with some slight alteration. Things like the whistler and his dog. Fisk first, okay, I didn't move the slide. There we go. His first uh, published composition, A Christmas Carol, appeared in 1910. Uh, several more published works followed in 1916 and 18, capped by the first notice of a public recital of his works, given the latter year in New York's Aeolian Hall by vocalist Greta Masson. Fisk's own public debut was made in December 1920 and noted in the New York Herald Tribune on December the 5th. Um, from 1921 comes what would seem to be the first among his works to reveal his satirical side, a cycle entitled Songs of Fat People. The individual song titles are Mary and I, The Ground Around My Feet, and Reasons. At some point, Fisk entered Harvard, but he left when he traveled to Europe in 1922. There's a short notice in the New York Times from April 18, 1922, of a Dwight Fisk recital given shortly before his departure at the Princess Theater with soprano Dorothy Fox. The works mentioned include a setting of Les Elfes, of Le Comte de Lille, presented as a monologue and read by the actor Paul Lezac, who is a member of Eva Le Gallienne's company. Falso contrib Fox contributed the Fisk songs Metamorphosis, A Great White Bird, Little Boy Blue, after the poem of Eugene Field, and A Stevenson Cycle. Fisk referred to mistakenly in the note as Mr. Fox, continued with some solo piano compositions, including a romance dated to 1914, and excerpts from the Russian ballet, which his audience encored. Fisk's 1922 passport application implies that a previous overseas junket had been canceled, possibly owing to the over outbreak of the Great War. In some, courses, in some sources, Fisk is said to have studied at the Paris Conservatoire, but Fisk himself states that he studied at the Sorbonne, which never had a music program. They had a musicology program that was part of the humanities section. But if he really attended the Sorbonne, perhaps he was sent to Europe to study something else, like law, rather than music. Nevertheless, we do have evidence of Dwight Fisk's work while in Paris. Through manuscripts found in the Chester McKee collection at the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. McKee was an American conductor who spent some pre-war and most of the interwar year, years in Europe. Apparently the first American to lead the Vienna Philharmonic around 1920. The text of the pieces, Factory Girls, Nocturne in a Factory Town, Hunger, and Metamorphosis were written by future transition editor Eugène Jola and first sung with the Paris Conservatoire Orchestra under McKee by the acclaimed French soprano jean Vix. Vix. In his autobiography, Man from Babel, Eugène Jola recalled the great day arrived and there was a final rehearsal in the morning. It went badly, however, and the nerds of all the performers were decidedly on edge. Dwight Fisk had not finished his orchestrations of my songs and was still working in one corner of the concert hall. We were all quite depressed when the rehearsal was over and the an an anticipated disaster, but somehow the concert went off well. Dwight got an ovation for a remarkable job, and uh, Jacques Leclerc and McKee received many bravos for their performance of the Schumann Concerto. And I, meanwhile, kept the wires burning with publicity material about this triumph of, a musican, uh, of American musicianship. 
these music manuscripts are in dire need of editing. And I'm applying for a grant to make the pilgrimage to Pittsburgh to, in hopes of creating playable scores from these sources. In the meantime, Tim Williams of the Carnegie Library has sent me some Xerox copies of single sheets of this music. And I would like to share 30 seconds of a typically crappy sounding MIDI of the first seven measures of this piece, Nocturne in a Factory Town. And uh, I chose this one because the manuscript was the easiest to read and it'll be everything up through here. but it's pretty proficient. Um, okay. Despite the ovation and the doors, the concert may have opened for him in the field of art music. It appears that Fisk's efforts in this direction as a composer of serious art music did not outlast the Roaring Twenties. Indeed, Fisk began his rock and tour and piano comedy phase in Paris during these years, entertaining Americans escaping from the dry prohibition that had overtaken their native land. In his note for musical satires, Fisk writes, at the very moment where his tone poem, Hunger, was performed by the Lamoureux Orchestra in Paris, sudden lack of funds and the strange need to keep eating brought him to the tables of the rich American colony. After dinner, he would make up musical caricatures of the guests without mentioning any names, and so on would live to the next dinner. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> An encounter with actress Marie Dressler appears to have convinced Fisk to finally abandon his attempts at joining the ranks of George Ontile, Aaron Copeland, and Roger Sessions, and becoming a fully-fledged nightclub entertainer. Uh, according to Fish, she told him, you, are a you have a very distinct new form of entertainment. Do you want to be one more musician or do you want to make a lot of money and be a success in a new field? Fisk made one other vo vo voyage to Europe in the late 1920s and later cited this trip as the beginning of his transition from an ordinary nightclub entertainer to an international star. The liner notes to his 1955 album, Songs His Mother Never Taught Him, read, Once upon a time, Dwight Fisk was taken to a cocktail party and introduced to Tulula Bankhead as a talented American. Tululu tattooed, everyone brings me unknown Americans, why? Dwight played for Tallulah, who then said, Darling, what can I do for you? Through her, he received a few two weeks engagement at the Bat Club in London, where he was held over for nine months. Thus was launched one of the most fabulous careers in the history of show business. Those have got to be Fisk's own words. Um, Fisk returned to America on the SS Tuscania on September the 30th, 1929. In 1938, the magazine Life referred to Fisk as a former concert pianist. Tallulah Bankhead was noted as a peripheral, peripheral member of the Algonquin Roundtable, which some of you may know, it was a loose coalition of writers, artists, and musicians that met at a certain table at the Algonquin Hotel here in New York City on a regular basis between 1920, 1919 and 1929. One source identifies Fisk as an Algonquin table ditty, ditty writer, 
but it was doubtful that he ever held a seat at the table. Uh, he is mentioned briefly by Robert Benchley in his 1927 book, The Early Worm, and Benchley also contributed the foreword to Fisk's book, Without Music, which was published in 1933. However, Fisk was a very close friend to the Ohio-born novelist Don Powell, whose diaries provide the only unvarnished insight that we have into the personality of Dwight Fisk. Powell was not a round tabler, but is often thought of in the same context as Dorothy Parker, who was a member and shared Powell's taste for witty, singing, stinging satire. Um, Powell and Fisk's friendship survived their collaboration, but the latter put a strain on it, and she was deeply hurt by his lack of acknowledgement to her, of her contributions to his routines. Indeed, out of the 65 routines Fisk recorded, only two were credited on record to Powell. But if the ratio she indicates for Fisk's books without music holds true for the entire cycle, then it was more like half. In an entry dated September 19, 1932, she writes, I have no feeling for Dwight anymore. His affectionate telegrams humiliate me by their thinly veneered desire for me to do something for him. He is unscrupulous and heartless and thoroughly materialistic. After the publication of Without Music, she adds, Dwight's book, dedicated to me, is receiving tremendous acclaim. He has set his traps so well, managed himself like a shrewd businessman managing an artist. Not a bit of his own value does he miss or underestimate. All of this means work, and he deserves his success. Of the 25 stories, I did a large part of 13, so it seems bitterly ironic that the reviewers who were so savage about my play should rave so about lines, usually mine, from this book. Fisk kept Powell very busy writing routines throughout the 30s, though not to the detriment of her novels, and he paid her handsomely in hard times, and she noted his additions to her bottom lines um, in her diaries. Uh, I cannot envy his success, she writes, for he has worked far too hard, maneuvered, fought, and it is not as a writer but as a personality that he seeks a unique recognition. I do despise the reviewers so easily bought, as Dwight sardonically knows, by a mere smell from society, so cringing before money and social register when they should divert that reverence to a Wells or a Balzac or even an O'Neill. And she spells Wells as in H.G. Wells. It may be difficult in retrospect to separate Powell's work from Fisk's, but there are clues. Powell published her novel, The Story of the Country Boy in 1934, and Dwight Fisk first recorded Town and Country Boy in 1939. Um, her diaries record that they collaborated on routines for others, such as Texas Guinan, and that they did occasionally draw material from the real lives of people around them. Quote, did, an on, did a story about Otto Kahn with Dwight yesterday, unquote. Not everyone in upper class society was anxious to be skewered in public by Dwight Fisk. In 1941, Fisk was sued successfully by Philip Pratt of the Pratt Institute over his routine Coney Island Honeymoon. Um, that was one among a high handful of Fiskana routines that uh, Fisk never returned to among his later recordings. Um, he began his work in New York towards the end of Prohibition in expensive speakeasies such as the Mayfair Yacht Club. Although the start date of Fisk's engagement at New York's 
Save Plaza, Savoy Plaza Hotel Cafe Lounge is not known. He became a fixture and performed there regularly until 1943. Called King Lear by Variety, Fisk was a tireless self-promoter, commencing his Fiskana series of recordings in 1933. He published two illustrated songbooks, the aforementioned Without Music and Why Should Penguins Fly in 1937, likewise uh, dedicated to Don Powell. The typography of these books represents fixed texts in a highly novel way, in short lines of poetry like E.E. E. Cummings' work, and it has to be assumed that this is the format into which he and Powell preferred to organize them. Mrs. Pettibone was Dwight Fisk's personal chef d'oeuvre. He recorded it four times more than any other of his pieces, and it was usually mentioned in the press coverage of Fisk that went so far as to describe what he did. Fisk takes on the first person voice of a woman, Mrs. Pettibone, fair, fat, and 40, describing the sexual disappointments that she has experienced with her various husband at a meeting of the Women's Guild. We heard the beginning of this record under the front title. So what we're going to do is pick it up from that same spot. And this is approximately where it starts. I'm missing page 61. So this will break out, but it resumes with the words, oh hell, I've done this so many times. <laughs> Now I'm going to call on Mrs. Pettibone, who has buried three husbands to tell us everything she knows. Now Mrs. Pettibone arose fair, fat, and sporty with a twinkle. She was like that all day long, as biological. The ladies of the guild and your distinguished president, I'm sure you expect me to tell you far more than I know. But any information I can give you, I will give you with all my heart. As you all know, my first husband, Mr. Brown, had two heads and a bad case of halitosis. I never knew which way to look. When he died, I buried him with nothing but a bird. Now, my second husband, Mr. Thayer, related to your dear, dear president, was an extraordinarily well-built man to look upon outside the home. But inside the home, what a fraud. He was too little to talk about. I called him Numbnut. When he died, I buried him with nothing but a bird. But now, ladies of the guild, lend me your ears. My last husband, Mr. Pettibo, was a man in every sense of the word, as you all know too goddamn well. I'll never forget our wedding night. God, what a night. We went to Fall River and had a big fish dinner. Why, I will never know. Directly after dinner, he said, let's go upstairs. And I thought, oh, hell, I've done this so many times. Well, we went upstairs anyway, to a little room, overlooking a lot of factories and the old Fall River line. As I stood there wondering what he was going to do next, suddenly, without a word of warning, he popped out of his clothes and plunged into an old hot tub. Meanwhile, I peeked through the door and was not too displeased. Then, being an old-timer, I jumped into bed myself and said, Come, what may? When suddenly the bathroom door opened and out, came Mr. Pecky Bone. Just as naked as a child and twice as cocky. He came out of the bed and he clapped his hands and he kicked his heels and he said, And now, Mrs. Pettibone, if you please. And now, Mrs. Pettibone, if you please, was his big tagline. As I said in the article, his equivalent of what Eat My Shorts did for Bart Simpson. 
Okay, uh, discussion of the records themselves. My script is really long in the tooth on this subject, so I'm just going to try to wing it to solve us, save us a little time. Um, this is the, well, we'll start here. This is, there's only one record like this, and in fact, I, I think there's only one known copy of it. Uh, this was the first Viscana recorded at the Byers Studio in New York City, which was uh, a, a facility that did radio work and, and uh, also recorded uh, for the star piano company, Jeanette. Um, I don't think that he much liked these records because, uh, uh, well, this one, because he ended up going to RCA Victor that very same year and starting uh, the Fiscana line, which he ran from 1933 to 1937. Nearly all of Fisk recordings were made in New York. However, there was one session in 1936 that was made at HMV in London, and those were all released on Fiscanics. Um, in 1943, uh, internal RCA Victor paperwork informs us that all of the masters for Viscana were uh, recycled for scrap that year. Gala, which has a very complex history, um, was founded, uh, it, it was based in the Empire State Building. It was founded by a guy named Ben Lane in 1939, and Fisk uh, joined on in 1943, and in fact, we need to, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Okay, I get it. In between his work for Gala, there, the Liberty Music Shop discs were made. That was an album set that had uh, routines he didn't do elsewhere, except for one, Van and Knight. His Excellency, Town and Country Boy, are in that set, and those were made in 39. The Galas began in 43. A lot of them are dubbed from Fiscanas. So you're dubbing a 12 inch record down to a 10 inch record, and they sound pretty poor. Fisk was the only artist on party records to primarily issue his stuff on 12 inch records. He needed uh, the extra time to get his long, dirty stories onto the wax. Okay, so as soon as Fisk got Fiskana out in 1934, Nan Blackstone started her record company. Literally the following year. She had actually begun recording in 1927, but nothing risque, but uh, she essentially was the next in line. And then by 1935, anonymous party records like Hair Lip Salesman here, and Uncle Tom's Cabin, which you'll be glad I have, and you'll be glad I didn't bring it. Um, the, the, this was the beginning. I, I mean, literally, as soon as he flung open the door, everybody else came streaming through. And um, uh, he, these other records are kind of out of the scope of uh, the Fisk study, but they happened because he was there. All right, uh, to resume, this is the cover of the Liberty Music set. Wish I had one. That's a really nice Art Deco design. Um, the, as I said, that the, the Fiscanas were dubbed to galas, and then he remade them, and then he added more selections. Um, and some there, so his routines exist both in remakes and in alternate takes. 65 routines, but most of them were recorded at least twice, some three times, and Mrs. Pettibone four. And then in addition to that, among the galas, alternate takes are frequent. There are so many that even Deal doesn't know how many. So 65 routines, but more than 100 recordings, probably like 150, 160, which would make him one of the most prolific 
uh, creator of party records in the field. This is an ad for Gala in 1946. As you can see, Fisk is at the very top. Nan Blackstone is towards the bottom, and oddly, Lee Wiley is at the bottom. Um, and then these were the first LP issues of Fisk on Gala. These were 10 inch LPs, and uh, this one has a sticker with the titles, but they also have printed titles. The covers are identical, though they change color. There are four of them. Okay, in 1952, Fisk is suing Gala. Uh, they, hadn't, they haven't paid him anything. Um, he had struck an agreement with them in 1948 that if, uh, that if they didn't pay him anything in the quarter to follow, then it would nullify the contract, they would withdraw the discs, and he was free to go with another label. Well, they just kept right putting them right out. So eventually he took them to court. But it became a moot point because then Gala went bankrupt. Um, this is his last album, initially released on the Obscure Monarch label. It was recorded by George L. Bard and resurfaced on Jubilee under the title Songs His Mother Never saw, Taught Him. That was uh, Fisk's last record. Um, we're going to hear some more examples of his music um, and patter. This is Anthony and Cleopatra. Enjoy. Anthony and Cleopatra. Now the Egyptians called Cleopatra the symbol of love. But the Romans called her just a pushover. So Mark Antony thought he'd find out for himself. So he came to Egypt with an army of 50,000 men. 50,000 men! Just to prove to Cleopatra that he was the one and only man in Egypt. Now he was carrying all sorts of presents for the Queen of Egypt. Inside his satchel was an old jar of massage cream. Two shiny red apples and 16 lewd postcards that later were going to be destroyed by Vesuvius. Come on, man, he shouted. Come on, come on, come on. Left, 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 right, left. 50,000 men. 50,000 men. Marching, marching to Cleopatra. Now Cleopatra had a very different idea of Mark Antony. She thought he'd be a Roman Apollo with slight French tendencies. So she was making up madly all day because she had a mouth like a torn pocket. Caused by a lot of little things she didn't care to remember. And Isis and Crocus, her maids, were covering her with wisteria water and stuffing old mushroom blossoms in her hair. All the while, she was sitting in a golden bowl of sandalwood oil, just in case Mark Antony pulled a quick one. Suddenly, she heard a fanfare of trumpets. And there was Mark Antony with his 50,000 men. They were all in by now. 50,000 men. Right at the gates of Cleopatra's palace. Just like Cleopatra to do nothing about it. Keep them waiting and they weaken in the end with her mother. Well, all Mark Anthony wanted to do was sit down and open his suitcase and surprise everybody. After keeping them waiting 15 minutes, she decided she'd go down and see what it was all about. So slipping on her famous ruby tall top, she started down the stairs. All her feet were touching the ground. Flat-footed Cleopatra. When suddenly she realized she had no present for the distinguished guest. So she snatched up a bottle of three-star Hennessy and stepped out on the balcony. When Mark Anthony thought he saw her, he said, Hooray! 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 Cleopatra! And the entire army shouted ditto and waved whatever they had at hand. After two minutes, she said thank you and waved two things back. Mark Antony was now in striking distance of the Queen when suddenly he opened his suitcase and everybody said, We 
Mark Antony. When Cleopatra saw the present, she became cold. She expected much more. Mark Antony saw the terrible change come over her face. He realized he must do something desperate. So he took out the biggest prize he had. The plans for the fall of Rome. Fulger. Now, instead of doing something desperate, she beckoned to him. And they left the assembly and barged out on the Nile, while under the great Egyptian moonlight, she gave him a great big hibiscus lay. After four years of this continued nonsense, she had herself bitten to death because she didn't know what else to do with her ass. That's one way you can tell the kiss. The king and the queen. Uh, a dub fist scan on a gala is when the end goes whoosh. I'm not sure why, but it's just, it, uh, the, it ends, the record ends right away, like there's no room. The king and the queen. Once upon a time, there was an old king. He was 79 years old and he regretted it. And he married a beautiful little princess, only 21. She was very annoyed one day because she didn't have a son. The king had been tired just a little bit too long. But it all happened quite suddenly, and she was sitting by her bedroom window. She looked out the window and spied a young knight coming up the drive, all dressed in silver armor. She burned up. So she looked out the window and gave him a glance. But he wasn't looking up just then, the fool. Going to a closet, she took out a white fur coat made of a hundred rabbits, laid end to end. You know what rabbits can do. And slipping it on, she came downstairs very quietly. All the servants were playing strip poker in the throne room, so they didn't see a thing. Now, when she opened the great oak doors, the stranger saw by her beautiful expression that she wanted. So he jumped right off his horse. Gave her a perfectly magnificent present. But she was a greedy little witch. And she said, is that all? And he said, no. So he gave her a dividend. But he jumped on his horse. And away he went. He was a pretty good rider. Then the queen went upstairs, not too quickly. She could just make it. She was so excited to find out what the happy night had given her. What do you suppose it was? A little princess. So she put it to bed and went to bed herself. Now, two days later, she got a letter from the king. He'd been in Scotland shooting grouse with a lot of dupe. He was a lousy shot, too. And the letter said, prepare a great feast because I'm coming home with 300 birds and a couple of friends, I hope. So the queen, who was always in bed these days, had to get up and go all the way downstairs into the kitchen. Now, the cooks had never seen the queen in the kitchen before, and they all fainted. That is, all but the pastry cook. He'd seen too much of everything, so he only bowed. When they came to, emergency said the king Two days later, the king came back on an old, tired Kentucky single foot. The only horse he could stick on to. When he came in the yard, he made a lot of noise with his saber. He said, where is her majesty? No one paid the slightest attention. They heard that old saber rattle too many times before, and nothing ever happened. So in a fit of rage, he lifted up the stirrup, took out a rope ladder, and climbed down the off side of the horse. Down he was mad. Now the queen received the king in the great baronial hall, made of virgin oak. Know, think of the irony. Welcome home, my lord. He said with no enthusiasm. He said thanks. And from out of his pocket, he took a little ruby necklace. He gave her four times and taken back. He said, Is the feast prepared? And she said yes. And that night, the greatest feast the world has ever known. Was on. Lords and ladies in silver brocade came marching in. 
Sonny the Rose Oak. And of all the stories, you can't have your king and eat your cake and have it too. So, um, I, I'm taking note of the time. I uh, do want to... I, I'd love to play the censored letter, which is sort of his World War II thing, but it's getting to be close to a quarter till. So let's move on to this next section where I want to talk specifically about his pianism. Um, he was necessarily a comedian, and the routines that he developed with Don Powell were designed to make people laugh. However, for me, Fisk's piano playing and music forms the most impressive part of his arsenal. Uh, for someone walking, working outside the realm of art music, his music is highly advanced and demonstrates contact with modernism of a kind that he would have gained from his experiences in Paris. Let's return for a second to that old Kentucky single foot in The King and the Queen. The Censored Letter. Sorry. Now, two days later, the king came back on an old, tired Kentucky single foot. The only horse he could stick on to. When he came in the yard, he... A random choice of notes, a skewered rhythm, and it's uh, developed to uh, illustrate a tired horse but as a musical entity in itself is a pretty interesting thing. Uh, some particularly dissonant, aggressive pass passages in Fisk recall Stravinsky, and in the case of, uh, uh, and well, also uh, the shadow of Claude Debussy hovers over Fisk's tale of Mr. Green, and um, while Debussy was widely understood by American musicians of the 1920s. This is really coming from the Debussy of the Etudes, the late Debussy that was somewhat tougher uh, material than, say, Claire de Lune. The story of Mr. Green. Let me tell you what happened to Mr. Green. You wouldn't believe it. It happened right here in Chicago, not a half a dozen blocks from this very spot. Mr. Green was eating his dinner all alone one of the most respectable places off Jackson Boulevard. It was not his first visit. He had just finished his ravioli. He was about to choke it down with a little California wine. But a young woman came up behind him and handed him a clean envelope with a dirty card inside. Mr. Green gasped. The card said, meet me at Gypsy Ring. 9.45, Anna Rona will be waiting. Mr. Green read the card twice. When he looked up, the woman had vanished, and two waiters were staring at him. And for you Scriabin fans... Columbus and Isabella. Check out. Isabella was pacing up and down the marble halls of the palace, clanking with presents she'd given herself. She was waiting for Columbus to come and prove to her that the earth was round. Outside the great hall window, she could see the Spanish Armada riding an old ground swell. With no protection but their Spanish pride. Columbus finally arrived. Two hours late, wearing his Discovery pin and carrying three eggs. One was white, one was brown, and the other was his own. Isabella was furious at his delay. Fisk worked uh, is sometimes reminiscent of another American composer who was schooled in the silent movie house, Carl Stalling. And Fisk approaches his, his musical in underpinnings in much the same way, through use of quotations, filler music to cover action, and special effects. Um, I'm uh, going to quickly 
Somehow I wound up at the very first frame. Let me, I did want to uh, end on this picture of Fisk participating in a uh, White Owl cigar ad in 1940. He was well enough, known enough to do this. Um, and he was actually a pretty famous guy in his time. But, I mean, obviously he was not a mass entertainer. He was somebody that was, you were going to, if, and his fans, uh, most of them probably voted for Hoover in 1932. Um, they were a well-heeled and well-educated bunch. Um, a few artists of his caliber are as completely forgotten as Fisk has been. There has not been a Dwight Fisk reissue on record since 1968, 50 years. Um, and uh, I wish I had the foresight to bring the e image of that album. For the front cover, they hired a midget and like a flousy dame to appear as Dwight Fisk and Nan Blackstone because they were both long dead by that time. Um, he, um, he died in New York City on November the 25th, 1959 at, at age 67, and he was the kind of guy that Lenny Bruce would poke fun at. Uh, Lenny Bruce said, uh, um, s someone asked him in the audience to do the golf game routine, which is a party record bit. And um, Bruce described it as a sort of devitalized Dwight Fisk routine with nothing left but the subtle switch. Um, and one time when Bruce, uh, when a patron walked out on him, Lenny Bruce said, what kind of humor is his humor? Is his humor the Joe E. Lewis, the Sophie Tucker, the double entendre, the naughty but nice, the spicy ha-ha, do you know what this means, wedding night jokes, motel jokes, Rusty Warren, Johnny Got a Zero, Dwight Fisk, Mr. Yo-Yo can't get his yo-yo up, he's got the biggest thingy in the Navy. So he became kind of an object of ridicule when American comedy truly began to grow up. And indeed, people like Mort Saul, Nichols, and May, they didn't need to result to the revert to the ancient royals or the infelicities of the wealthy for material. They were able to talk about sex in a very natural and straightforward way. Um, Dwight, however, was by far the premier risque comedian of the 1930s and 1940s, and he was in constant demand at the most posh watering holes. Any double entendre wit of the day could be expect to be compared to the archetypal Fisk. Fisk with Fiskana, which was an indie label, ushered in a new genre for the recording industry, and though none of his their their records were like his, it was classical music combined with wit rather than belly laughs, erudition, discretion, the collaboration of two razor-sharp razor writers and one expert dynamic performer. And it goes without saying that any study of American humor of this period which omits Dwight Fisk is fatally flawed. Thank you. So any questions? Oh, we may as well see the last slide. And that was supposed to go with that last bit. Yeah. I wanted to ask about how you think these records compare to R&B records from the 50s that also had a kind of blue double entendre. So think about like Work With Me Annie or Big Ten Inch Record, where their whole joke is, yeah, it's never explicit, and so it's similar. But as I understand, those R&B records were never like sold under the counter or anything. They could just buy them like at a normal store, right? Yes. By that time, I, you know, there it, there wasn't like such a hang-up, and it was, 
and also again, that's, they, those were popular in the R&B market at the time. Those were both, by the way, King Records from my hometown in Cincinnati. But um, thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, and uh, but but the thing is, the R&B market was a little looser than like the mainstream white okay. pop market, where you had things like beep beep. Beep beep, this one with beep, beep 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 beep, and that was about as risque as you're likely to get. Whereas, you know, work with me, Annie, yeah, that was pretty seriously risque. Were any of these, was any of ever tried for obscenity from these party records? Well, no, but he was accused of being obscene by Brooks Atkinson of the New York Times which was actually kind of a serious thing. Um, and that, uh, I mean, he was an extremely powerful critic. And so, uh, so like his colleagues had to figure out whether or not uh, Dwight Fisk was obscene and whether it was even worth covering his work. And some of them didn't, but he was never tried uh, as far as I know, for his records, there are, there are other people that work. Okay, work Interesting in that you brought up um, Ray Ray Moore as part of this, and you know it makes me think of some of the records that I find in my collection from over the years. You know, Doug and the Hot Nuts, or a Ray Ray Moore record, or a Boston Warren record. But then there are these other records, like say Abe Burroughs or uh, Stan Freeberg, people who didn't incorporate sex necessarily in their works, but were working in a musical, satirical. Do you, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is, do, do you draw a direct correlation with that kind of material? Do, do you think that they, those people listened to him? Do you think they were influenced and had it? an idea as to what they wanted to present because of the things that he was doing? Or is that just a whole other? That brings it, that's a very good question. You know, I met Stan Freeberg once, and I wish I had asked him, did you ever listen to Dwight Fitz? It would have been a good question. Yeah. Um, it's hard to know what his direct outreach was among other artists, other than he started making money making party records. And it was obviously that a place to make money and, and yeah, people were ready. Now, as far as like the extent to which his work was possibly absorbed by straight comedy artists who also use music, I must say I haven't given that a lot of thought. But, you know, I, I'd be interested in, in considering it. So it only came to me only because I don't find myself reaching for a lot of those other records, but I do reach for the eight boroughs and or the free work yeah. Which is fun. <laughs> yeah, I have one of Stan's albums sitting over my desk at the moment. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's, there's definitely, and, and by the way, not a very nice guy, in my opinion, <laughs> but, but definitely a great artist. So. Any other questions? This is not a question, but um, to follow up on what you, know, you pointed out, you know, his, his great music, his great pianist, and he was great, great, he was a very competent musician. Um, and after you're suggesting it, I think it's very, it seems very clear to me that he has done, he did a bunch of, or was very lucky did a bunch of silent film accompaniment. To pull off many of the musical figures that he does and do the spiel on t simultaneously is, a little short of astounding. I would agree. So that he's not just, you know, he's not a band, but he's not playing rhythm. He's doing these complex things. And this whole counterpoint voice, you know, story, it's really impressive. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's like nothing I've heard. And and that's one thing that amazes me about him is, I mean, okay, it's enough that he plays the piano as well as he does. But how do you talk and do that? Remember the whole long routine, all those words? And, and deliver it as effectively as yeah. he does, you know, yeah. Those are like two sets of parts of the brain. Uh, I mean, to be able to do that simultaneously is, yeah. Yeah, which is another yeah. reason why I find it baffling that, that there's no CD 
you know, that, that I mean, such a high quality artist that had such an important place in, in the American music of the past who, who just doesn't get any love from reissue companies. Although, I'm hoping that either me or someone will convince Rhino uh, to do something because they, they own Jubilee. So they own one piece of the puzzle. I'm rather surprised about the album for Liberty because Liberty Music Shop was one of the major serious classical importers in New York. It was kind of like the gramophone shop except they were nice. Yeah. <laughs> and, they, and I did skip over the fact that Liberty the music, the Liberty Music Shop label was one of the first indies. It first appeared in 1930. I didn't realize it was that early, but it goes that far back. And they also mainly serviced the musical theater crowd in New York with, with their label, recording people like Beatrice Lilly and, I don't know, stage people. Because uh, I recall they had a series of pop albums, uh, none of which got very much publicity, and they sold only by Liberty. Right. Um, similar to the sort of thing that Ramaphone Shop did for Maggie Tate recordings. Uh, and I think most of the Liberty material and be issued in some form on CD, uh, Liberty being out of business since the end of the LP era. Do you have any sense of how many copies of the records you can sell? Well, he would have. In fact, I'm sure that that's what Ben Lane was doing was like, a, like, hey, how about some royalty money? Well, here, take some records. <laughs> but, you know, that's another problem with Fisk is that there's uh, no personal collection that I know of. I, I think that when he died, his stuff was just thrown in a dumpster. I mean, I, I skipped over a lot of that information, but, but David and I have covered, uncovered a lot of titles of classical compositions that he wrote, and like the only ones that I know that actually survive are the four scores in the McKee collection, and then that one very early song that's list, it's listed in CLC. So some library has a copy of it, but everything else seems to be gone. That's a real shame. He also recorded a children's record that uh, was not released. And um, that probably disappeared when RCA threw away the medals from the scan up. But yeah, I'd like to have that too, I think. So are we all finished? I guess we're out of time. Yes, it looks that way. Thanks, Thanks everyone for coming to chat about Dwight and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Really interesting presentation. And I'm just sorry we had to cut it somewhat short. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, the main points were made, so I'm always yeah. happy when that happens. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. There won't be any meetings over the summer, and the next session up here is going to be September 28th. Uh, I don't know offhand what it's going to be about, but it should be interesting. So in the meantime, we hope you all have a great summer and see you again in September. And thank you, Dave.